Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. And I feel a bit of an interloper, really. I am not an expert on housing, and least of all am I an expert on Irish housing. Um, I think Rory Hearn <coughs> should be in my place here. But um, I, I am here to talk about what I think is at the core of the housing problem, and it is a problem that isn't peculiar to Ireland, it is actually a, a global phenomenon. One of the things I find, I've been recently in Auckland, New Zealand, and Auckland, New Zealand has exactly the same problem as Dublin and Ireland have. <coughs> and what I think is hard for people to understand is that when they're buying a property in one of our cities, uh, in wherever it is in the world, they are participating not in a domestic market, not in a local market, but in a global market. They are competing with global forces for the right to have a roof over their heads. And that is what makes uh, life so difficult for people looking for housing. Yes, so Rory has written about the Irish situation with extraordinary clarity and depth. And so I recommend that you look at this and read his article for an even better understanding than certainly I have. One of the numbers that really struck me was he, said, he says that over 77,000 house, 77, households in Ireland are still in mortgage arrears, while the debt of the developers that owed billions has been written off. And it's quite extraordinary, that, is it not? Um, in Dublin, there are queues of hundreds of homeless people to get food in nightly soup runs, queues trying to get private rental accommodation, and queues of a different kind in higher income suburbs where families are outbidding each other to buy homes. Six trophy houses on one road in Dublin, four, were sold for between three and four million euros each in 2016. Meanwhile, 198,000 homes lie empty in Ireland, and that's about 13% of total housing. Now, and that's one of the central points that I want to make here. But I want to begin <clears throat> by my now regular and unseemly attacks on the economics profession. I'm getting myself a bad reputation amongst ec economists, and I want to exclude, of course, the distinguished economists like Professor Gary Dimsky, who's here with us today. There are, of course, some wonderful economists. But we have a real problem with the economics profession, not understanding what's happening to the economy. Um, and I've been reading a book about Roosevelt's New Deal and the start of the New Deal. And believe it or not, there's a parallel with what's going on here. So at the start of, uh, at the time of when uh, Roosevelt was elected in March 19, when he made his inaugural speech in March 1933, prices in, in the United States, especially agricult agricultural prices, were severely depressed. And this had, this was a monetary phenomenon. It was nothing to do with the value of agriculture and, and its importance within the economy. And what farmers were advised to do and what was being debated at the time prices were so, so low was that sections of farmland should be closed off, forcibly closed off by the state to reduce the product, to reduce supply of agricultural goods. And that, they argued, would increase demand and would increase, increase prices. And it's an extraordinary idea to have to think about, that you would go around the farms of the United States, and it's a massive country, closing off bits of land and enforcing the fencing off of bits of land in order to reduce production, in order to increase prices. That's how primitive economics was in trying to understand why there were falling prices in the United States after the, the crisis of 29. And equally, economists here don't understand why there are rocketing prices for property in Ireland and in Auckland and in London and in any big city, Shanghai, you name it, New York, in the world. And it has to do with, um, with the, uh, yes, and so what we see is, is uh, economists like Professor Ronan Lyons here in, 
Dublin arguing that what the market is witnessing now, with increases in sale and rental prices of more than 75% in some parts of Dublin, should surely be evidence enough that demand falls well short of supply, so the solution is more supply. Now, this, this law in economics, and what's so very interesting is that the Encyclopedia of Economics calls it a law, calls it a law of the economy. Right. And many economists treat it as a law. Now, I have a great problem with the idea that economic theory and policy becomes law. For me, one of the really big problems of the European Union is that economic policy is embedded in law like concrete. Economic policy should never be embedded in law. Economic policy is something that has to move and change with the economic cycle. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a legal thing. It is policy which reacts to crises and, and, and to prosperity and, and how to manage both. <coughs> but no, we are told by the Encyclopedia of Economics that it is a law of the economy. So in 2006, this law could have been applied to Ireland. Their Irish home construction peaked in that year. In a country of just 4 million people, more than 90,000 homes were built, and yet prices continued rising until they blew up. Right? So supply and demand were not playing here. What was playing was something quite different. And that is <coughs> that Dublin is host to safe and high-yielding assets, says De Deloitte, in the form of property. Now, I need you to understand and to take into account the word high-yielding. Right? <coughs> we are in a situation where, believe it or not, and, and most traditional economists would, would really balk at this, there's a shortage of sovereign debt in the world. There's a shortage of sovereign debt. We have a situation in Europe where economists, central bankers, uh, treasury officials are agonising over the fact there is not a single safe asset in Europe. And that desperately needs to be one. And that safe asset they would like to be an asset that competes with the US Treasury bill. And a US Treasury bill, which sounds innocuous, is actually US debt. Right? There's a shortage of that too. And what we have are huge investment uh, asset management funds, huge pension funds, huge life insurance fund in, funds, all holding masses of cash. Every month of the year, they funnel up our pensions, our savings, our life insurance uh, premiums, and they funnel all that up into a vast pool of cash. And the thing about cash is that it's not high yielding. It doesn't, doesn't itself, in itself, create new money. And so what these big firms like BlackRock, which has hired Mr. George Osborne at a mere £600,000 a year for a couple of days a month, BlackRock manages vast sums of, for example, pension funds. And they funnel up this cash every, every month, every year. And they want to do something with that which will yield again so that they will have more finance in the funding in the future to pay pensions, for example. Right? So what do they do? They go in search of a high-yielding asset. They take their cash and turn it into a bond, and it's a bond that yields interest every year, over 30 years, 100 years, or whatever. Right? This is, these are effortless games you can make if you hold a lot of cash. Right? But there's a shortage of those bonds. There's a shortage of debt. We are living through, as the title of this conference suggests, an age of austerity, an age when governments and economists wrongly believe that post-financial crisis in a slump, it's appropriate for the governments of the world to contract economic activity even more than it's already contracted by the private financial crisis, to make that contraction worse than it was in 2007 8 or at least to sustain that contraction over time. That's why Britain, for example, has failed to recover its pre-crisis strength. That is why 
We were at the bottom of the OECD league when it comes to rises, expansion of economic activity every year. Right? Because our government has decided, along with other European governments, that contracting the economy after a slump is a good idea. Somehow or other, it will, it will reduce the deficit, it will cut public debt, and we'll have less sovereign debt in the world. And you know what? The people who complain most about that aren't left-wingers like me. They are the managers of asset management funds. They are desperate for high-yielding assets. There's not enough sovereign debt. And what do they do? They turn to a city like Dublin, where there is property, some of it very risky, and therefore high-yielding. The interest on investment in this, the capital gains that can be made in investment in this asset are much higher than the capital gains that can be made on other assets. The problem is they are risky. You know, unlike British debt, sovereign debt, unlike US Treasury bills, unlike British gilt or German debt, this is the risky. But nevertheless, it's high yielding in the short term, so they make, make capital gains. Now, what's extraordinary is when I looked at these numbers with the help of uh, Ian Mul Mulhern, who's an expert on housing in Britain, and went to the CSO, I find that actually, as uh, Rory Hearn has already shown, that actually there is capacity, that there are vacant houses, and they're not just holiday homes. The green blocks on these charts are vacant properties. So, you know, Ireland has a vacancy problem, and so does Britain. It's quite extraordinary. In Britain, the uh, rate of household formation is lower than the availability, the supply of property. So this is not a, a supply and demand issue. There's something else going on here, right? There is, there is vacancy. There are vacancies, and there are vacancies in Dublin as well. The, the, the real problem is this. The Great Wall of Money, which was referred to this morning, $453 billion, according to... Um, uh, Cliff Kuhl and according to Cushman, I think they called, uh, who are in a global estate, real estate uh, 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 researchers, $453 billion globally is aimed at global markets in real estate. Now, the really important thing to understand about this wall of money is that land is finite. There's only this much of Ireland in place. You can't make you can't, uh, uh, Groucho Marx it, uh, once said, you know, you must invest in this stuff because they aren't making it anymore, right? <coughs> We're not making any more land. Ireland is bound by the sea and there's only that much that is island. It's a finite space and it's fixed. You can't move it across the border. It stays in Ireland. Land is fixed and finite. Money, by contrast is elastic. Credit is elastic. And its elasticity is potentially infinite. Because money is not a commodity, there can never be a shortage of money. <clears throat> and one of the problems with the economists is they don't understand money. They don't understand what it is. Joseph Schumpeter, John Maynard Keynes, J.K. Galbraith, John Law back in 1700 all understood money. But today's economists seem to have forgotten what was taught then. But Joseph Schumpeter explained very clearly that <coughs> money is nothing more than a promise to pay. Right? When I go into a coffee shop and I wave a little card at a machine and hey presto, my, my coffee is paid for, I'm not engaging in barter. My card doesn't get handed to the coffee maker. My card goes back into my pocket. My card says... Me, the, the, the manager of the uh, NatWest Bank, vouches for Anne Pettifor here. I, I, I guarantee that she can pay for her coffee, right? That's all that it says. It says you can trust. Now, that trust, of course, is underpinned by a contract. I've signed a contract. And the contract is underpinned by a criminal justice system, which enforces contracts. The bank has an accounting system, which manages my assets and liabilities. In Britain, we have an independent central bank, which manages the currency. 
that I'm buying my, co my coffee in and maintains it and kept, keeps it fairly stable, right? And we have, above all else, we have a sound tax collection system in Britain which underpins the value of the currency. The dollar is incredibly strong because they have about 60 million taxpayers. We have about 30 million taxpayers. That's money. So when I'm waving my hand at a little machine, I'm promising to pay. And there is almost no limit to the promises that we can make. We're limited by the fact we can't promise to hand over the land because there's a finite amount of land. We're limited by the finite nature of the ecosystem. We're limited by our, our own wit and intelligence, or lack of, right? There are limitations to our ability to promise to do something. But we can just promise to do something, and if it's, if it's possible, we do it. And money is just the thing that enables us, as John Maynard Keynes argued, to do what we can do. So money, unlike land, is elastic and can be infinite in supply. And here we see how it is, $453 billion. Um, if you want to believe and understand how infinite it is, then just look at the amount of debt that there is in the world. Because every credit I promise to pay is an obligation upon which someone else has a claim. So when I create credit, when I apply for a loan, and so on, someone, I, I simultaneously obtain cash or an asset but I simultaneously also um, become indebted. And if you look at the world, we something like 275% of global income today is debt. Private, corporate, household, and to an extent public. But public debt is a small part of the total, right? So what we're seeing there is an infinite expansion of credit, unlike land, which is finite and limited. And so when you have that happen, you get $17.7 .7 billion aimed at the Irish property market and a 12% increase over the year 2016. This is a wall of money being thrown at a finite asset. And this cap these capital flows, again, according to DC DTZ, and I'm having trouble getting... Uh, measuring capital flows, I have to tell you, is not an easy matter. And I'm no expert at exactly what's happening here in Ireland, but I get the impression from companies like DTZ that it has been rising like this, dramatically. And that's exactly what's been happening to house. If you throw money at a finite resource, of course its price is going to rise. But the thing about economists is that looking at the tangible stuff, you know, the construction companies building houses, the families applying for a home. These are all things we see on an everyday basis and that we touch. Economists are very good at looking and understanding that. This stuff is intangible. You know, we're not seeing $17 billion in paper money flowing into the country. We're not seeing $17 billion of gold flowing in. Most of this is sort of digital money coming in via computers. So economists tend to ignore it. So here we see also um, Deloitte have done an interesting analysis showing the, the amount of domestic credit going into property, other European credit going into property, and cross-border, which means global. It can mean the Russian oligarchs, it can mean Italian oligarchs, it can mean Indian boligarchs, as they're called. Um, but here we see uh, domestic is shrinking as a share of the capital flows aimed at property. Um, European is, is rising. People are moving their money out of parts of Europe. And uh, cross-border is the same as it was in 2014, but a lot higher than it was in 2012 and 2010. And that's telling us a very interesting and big story. So Irish people, the people who live here, are finding that the, th the thing that they need most, which is a roof over their head, in order to have a civilised and stable life, are being priced out by a lot of foreign money as well. And these house prices will begin to fall as capital flows decline. Now, the thing that worries... And it's ha that is, by the way, happening already in London, and it's happening in Auckland. It's actually happening in all the big, major global cities. And interestingly, it's happening at the top. 
is the most expensive housing, the newest blocks of apartments in London are failing to sell and their prices are falling. So we're beginning, to, it's bending definitely and go, beginning to go down. And I'm not sure what's happening here, but maybe uh, Owen will tell us. But the point is this, <coughs> and, and I haven't really done enough on, in the charts on this, is what do we do about it? What do we do about this? You know, can we do anything? The attitude of most economists is, no, 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 you have to leave this to the market. The market will sort this out. And sure enough, the market sorted it out in 2007-9. And is still sorting it out here in Ireland, as far as I understand. But what kind of sorting out is that, really? It's massively destructive. It's, it's deeply painful. And it leads to the rise of political unrest. It leads to Donald Trump. It leads to Brexit. It leads to the rise of the AFD in Germany. It leads to people wanting to have protection from market forces. And the most tangible protection they seek in the first instance is from migrants. But actually, the instability in their lives is not caused by migrants. It's caused by these capital flows. So what to do? My, my view is that the only thing that can be done is that we must manage those capital flows. We've got to get to the point where we don't, we don't sit back on our seats and say, let this happen, because it's nature, it's natural. These are man-made, and I mean mad-made, economic systems, right? Women, on the whole, were not involved in this lot. <laughs> <coughs> and um, they can be unmade, and we can make another system. And we did, we have done. We have experience of managing capital flows. In my lifetime, we did this during what is known by every economist, even the most orthodox, as the golden age in economics, right? 1945 to 1971, roughly, we managed capital flows across borders. And everyone agrees that that was one of the most prosperous periods in all history. It was pretty dull, I can tell you. We never did Sunday shopping or anything exciting like that. You couldn't buy an 11,000-pound pink crop crocodile handbag anywhere, as you can these days, but, but we had stability. We had social, political stability, and on the whole, we had prosperity. And that didn't just apply to the rich countries. It applied, and I'm from South Africa, it applied to poorer countries in Africa too. And we know how to do it. We know that our central bank and our treasuries, using macroprudential tools, <laughs> can do it. Now, I am on the heterodox end of of the economics um, profession. I, I can't call myself a professional at all. But <clears throat> I was delighted when one of the most orthodox economists went to the meeting of <coughs> central bankers meeting in Jackson Hole in 2013 and said to them, there have been virtually no benefits whatsoever from capital mobility, she said. And she argued that it was about time that we began to manage capital flows. Now, for someone to write a paper like that and to have it published at Jackson Hole was remarkable. And it is actually a very famous paper and is well read everywhere. So I am arguing here that we need to start thinking about managing capital mobility, subordinating the finance sector to the interests of the society, making finance once again servant to the economy and not master of the economy. Thank you very much.